Optional Clinician uh, Scholar Program at Yale University. And after this, we were very fortunate to recruit him to the University of Michigan in 2021, where he has escalated the ranks from clinical instructor to assistant professor. He has received multiple accol accolades, including the ACC WCC 2020 Young Investigator Award for Outcomes Research. His work is supported by an NIH K23 grant related to cardiovascular outcomes related to nutrition policies among so socioeconomically disadvantaged populations. He's a current interim director of preventive cardiology at University of Michigan, as well as the co-chair of the ACC Prevention of Cardiovascular Disease section. Dr. Brandt is a cardiologist and lipidologist who studies the effects of nutrition policy on population outcomes. He's interested in uh, evaluating the clinical and healthcare implications of current and planned nutrition policies at the federal, state, and local level, especially among socioeconomically disadvantaged individuals. His previous work examined outcomes for the New York trans fat restrictions in restaurants, availability of grocery delivery to food uh, deserts, the epidemiology of lipoprotein A, and the mechanism of action of PCSK9 inhibitors, among other topics. He will be presenting today social determinants of health, nutrition policy, and cardiovascular outcomes. Welcome, Eric. Thank you, Victor, for the wonderful introduction. So, um, as he said, I'm also a cardiologist and a lipidologist. Maybe you're expecting to hear about lipids today, but today I'm going to kind of geek out on my academic topic and we're going to talk about social determinants of health, some nutrition policy, and cardiovascular outcomes. So thank you for having me today. All right, so first, um, relevant conflicts of interest. And sorry, there's a little bit of a delay here in the screen. Um, the, the main one being that I will be talking about some of uh, my primary funding uh, with the K23 award. All right, well, let's get into the talk. And uh, as a roadmap, I'm going to first be talking about social determinants of health. In this first part, we'll talk about understanding what they are and how they relate to cardiovascular outcomes. Then we'll dis discuss, discuss some examples and why it's important for you to know as a clinician in particular. And then we're going to talk about what we're already doing here at the University of Michigan, things that I can't claim that I've done, but the university is doing as a whole. We're going to talk about CMS, and then we're going to transition a little bit. I'm going to take a turn. I'm going to delve into some of my work in health and nutrition policy. And in this second part, I really hope to convince you that as clinicians and academics, that we hold quite a bit of power to make changes that can impact many lives. All right, so first let's talk, start with a, a patient case example. The case is a 32-year-old patient and um, uh, her and her parents immigrated from the Pacific Islands. She was admitted with a cardiomyopathy in 2020 and she was started on excellent goal-directed therapies. After her discharge, she didn't make any of her subsequent visits. Um, and then almost a year later to the date, she showed up again in the emergency room with the same type of heart failure symptoms and the same scenario as the first time. This time again, she had excellent diuresis and medical care, symptom, symptom improvement. She was started on goal-directed therapies, and the uh, only difference is she left with a life vest this time. Then again, now a third admission, almost exactly a year later, the same thing happens. On that admission, um, we talked to her about her limitations, and uh, we worked with social work. We set her up with ride shares so she can make it all, to all of her outpatient visits. And then on her uh, discharge anniversary, uh, that next year she did not come back and she subsequently done well. So let's start with the definition of social determinants of health. Oh. Sorry about that. So social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, and age. And they're the wider set of forces and systems that shape the conditions of daily life. And this definition is from the CDC. In this figure from a recent publication, we show how social determinants of health and health outcomes are related. Shown on the left are the five domains that we categorize um, for social determinants of health. And I'll review each of these shortly so you can get an idea of what they include. 
Um, but we want to hit on the overall goal of this figure. And on the right are health and well-being or health outcomes. And often by the time patients make it to clinical care, they've already developed these downstream consequences from the social determinants of health. The ultimate impact on health outcomes can be seen in two large ways. First, they can act as direct effects, and these are the things like food insecurity or nutrition insecurity, wherein things like malnutrition can directly lead to negative health consequences. They can also act via indirect effects or effect modifiers, and I'll call them the case example. In that case, lack of transportation led to a lack of access to care, and then these pathways then led to downstream health consequences. So keep these two types of pathways in mind. Um, and we might not always be able to directly uh, impact these, but being aware of them can greatly impact how we think about someone's care. It's also important to understand that these social determinants of health ultimately are the major drivers of health outcomes. It's been estimated that 40% of health outcomes are related to social and economic factors. 30% are from health behaviors. 10% are from the physical environment. And after accounting for these, 20% of health outcomes uh, result directly from clinical care. That means if we're not thinking about these other things, particularly social determinants of health and integrating them into our care models, then uh, we're ignoring the largest contributor to health outcomes in our patients. Within this paradigm, healthcare is evolving to be something that operates outside of the clinic and hospital walls. And although we not, might not be able to directly change, uh, a social determinant, we can certainly integrate it into our care and how we think about um, treating that patient. To show this in another way, I'm working with uh, Sasha and Vank on understanding how social determinants of health and lifestyle factors impact the association between lipoprotein A and risk for MI. So I'll talk a little bit about lipids today. And when we made a five point social determinants of health score that included being unemployed, having a low income that's uh, below 300% of the federal poverty level, less than a high school education, not having regular access uh, to healthcare, and uh, having government or no health insurance, each additional point increase um, in that score from zero to five was a 12% increased uh, risk for myocardial infarction. If we compare this to some of the other risk factors that we are very aware of and commonly talk about, you can see that this is on par with having a moderately elevated lipoprotein little a and uh, much higher than a 25 point increase in non-HDL cluster also. These are major, major clinical risk factors. All right, in this next part, I plan to lay out examples of how each of these domains has been studied in the context of cardiovascular health outcomes. While doing so, I'll provide examples of how they can be assessed and also addressed in the clinical setting. There, there's really a, a ton of potential ground that I could cover here, um, and one could spend an entire talk on just one of these areas. So I plan to really just hit the highlights to put these into context. And I envision this as part of the part of the talk where I lay out a lot of the data, and then we're going to turn after this to reviewing um, what we're doing here to integrate it into clinical care. The first social determinant that I'll cover is economic stability. In this study, using tax records, it was found that the poorest versus the richest individuals have a much shorter lifespan. In the figure here, you can see the income percentile on the x-axis as the expected age and the and the expected age of death on the y-axis. The poorest individuals have 14 and a half year shorter lifespan for men and 10 year shorter lifespans for women. It's important to recognize that low income doesn't stand alone, but it's associated with many other factors and reasons why health outcomes can be worse, like access to food or quality of food, for example. Um, so it, none of these factors stand alone. And the data are clear that being poor is associated with other types of adverse health outcomes that might explain higher mortality among the poor including um, because of worse health care. For example, those that are poor have higher risk for death from myocardial infarction, which may be at least partially due to lower receipt of angiography uh, within 24 hours of acute coronary syndromes. Also, the poor are less likely to receive guideline-directed medical therapies. And there are several both easy ways and tools that are available to assess economics, but being aware of this for our patients is extremely important and simply just asking about their employment status um, can be helpful, especially given the large amount of financial toxicity individuals can experience after having a health event. Next, uh, we'll talk about education. One's education is uh, a major determinant of health and in many studies is 
the largest single explanatory social factor to explain differences in health outcomes. And as you can imagine, education level impacts many things, including future earning potential, the ability to follow therapeutic plans, basically the whole gamut of what we do in life. And in the graph that I've included here, you can see the stark differences in risk for myocardial infarction based on level of education. With those having tertiary or higher level education having under half of the risk for myocardial infarction. Um, and um, we, can, we can think about this um, in many ways and even simply being aware if an individual understands uh, based on their health literacy is important to make sure they understand the plans. There's also several other individual and health system tools that, are, that I've listed down here that are being integrated into more hospital care models over time. Next, for healthcare access, the problem is self-evident. If patients aren't plugged in, then how can we care for them and help them out? And the highlight that I wanna make here is that primary care is essential, especially since many of these paradigms rely on primary care uh, to have the ability to coordinate more closely with uh, social workers and other community resources. Also, they may have a longer uh, relationship with patients that, that may make them trust uh, the primary care doctor uh, more closely. We have obviously a primary care access problem locally, so um, this can be a ma major barrier for uh, helping to address some of these social determinants. Next, for the, for the neighborhood and built environment, um, housing is an, has an obvious impact, and it can be an extreme uh, barrier to the treatment of chronic, chronic disease. Without a home or stable housing, how can we expect someone to manage complex medical conditions, especially ones that increasingly require things like refrigeration of medications um, and safe storage of uh, medications in certain ways? Without a home or um, stable housing, it's really impossible to do that. And this is part of the reason why the homeless in our country experience two to three times higher um, uh, risk for cardiovascular mortality. And these are very important to address through um, a community-focused lens. And this is why integrating social workers and uh, GAP assistants in, in the case of the Michigan system are really important. So engaging these members and finding ways to en engage them in our clinical paradigms um, can be uh, drastically uh, important for these individuals. Also within the neighborhood and built environment is one we're more familiar with, which is physical activity. So many factors go into levels of participation in physical activity, including different types of personal factors and preferences, but also the local environment. And we need to be prepared in clinic to really think about how patients can increase their physical activity and integrate it into their unique situations. In reality, uh, what we should do is have a strong sense of individual's length and type of exercise they perform and put this into the, their individual context. You can see that, um, much like many other uh, traditional risk factors uh, in the US, we're doing a, a poor job at, at meeting guidelines and only about one in four individuals meet the recommended exercise threshold. So um, this, the, the social environment and built environment can be a major part of this. All right, the, the last, gra gra last, last graph on the last slide showed um, another major determinant on that, which was race and racism. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that now. Um, another major example uh, of the impact of is racial is the impact of racial segregation, wherein the experience of racism can lead to negative health consequences. And there are biological mechanisms for this. This includes uh, increased inflammatory markers uh, based on stress responses. And um, on a broad geographic level in the United States uh, and beyond, there remains a legacy of historic policies that have led to health, uh, worse health outcomes among socially vulnerable communities. So we need to recognize this history and uh, think about ways that we, we can overcome those negative impacts. As one of the major examples of this, I show the results of practices from the 1930s in which the homeowners loan corporation made maps of neighborhoods to decide on mortgage approval appropriateness. They color coded these in different colors with the red colors or the red outlined areas having the lowest approval appropriateness. And despite this practice being banned for half a century, many decades, um, there's still a there's still a legacy of uh, negative health outcomes related to them. On the graph on the left, um, you, you can see that the red line neighborhoods and the red bars, um, and you can see that there's an increasing pattern with uh, lower um, neighborhood appropriateness for approval, that there have increased risk factors in 2019, so 90 years after these practices were started, for major risk factors like diabetes, uh, being a smoker, obesity, 
higher blood pressure and high cholesterol. And also for uh, hard clinical outcome events like having coronary disease, stroke, and chronic kidney disease. While on the topic of race and racism, I'll show this paper recently published in The Lancet. And they looked in NHANES at the association between race and mortality. And they found that black individuals had about 60% higher mortality than other, other races. They also looked at social determinants of health. And you can see on the graph shown above and the, um, uh, the cumulative mortality curve shown below that uh, the mortality rate greatly increases with cumulative social determinants of health with having just one social unfavorable social determinant of health on their scale with about double the rate uh, for mortality. By the time you get to three, that's up to four times and then at six or more, um, although not super common in the population is up to eight times higher risk for mortality. And then they combine those two concepts. And once, it, once they controlled for social determinants, they find that there's really no difference in risk for mortality between black and white individuals. And in the, t in the table, what you can see is the hazard ratio goes from that 1.6 or 60% higher number that I quoted before down to 1.00 with adding in these social determinants of health to their, to their data. So data such as these are important. And uh, what they're important for is helping us to recognize that the underlying contributors to racial and ethnic inequities in health are uh, driven by things like systemic racism and the social de determinants of health that are uh, come from them, rather than be being primarily driven by biological differences. So I found this paper to be really interesting. And as I was saying, what we need to do as health systems is recognize the impact of historic policies and find ways that we can challenge them and challenge ourselves to overcome their impact. Um, and that comes not only from integrating ourselves within our local community, but also promoting diversity within our workplace. And uh, these are just a few examples among many. All right, uh, next I'll, cup, I'll still sticking within the neighborhood and built environment, which is a big topic. I'll talk a little bit about transportation, which uh, as you recall, was the crux of the, crux of the problem for uh, the case example that I provided. And it can lead to things like delays in care and uh, worse health outcomes. And there's increasing ways to help to overcome this barrier, which include uh, state supports, particularly in Michigan that we have um, to, to help provide transportation. Um, there's also telemedicine, which uh, is a silver lining to the pandemic and really helps to increase access to uh, more distant areas. Um, also, there's other ways that we can think about integrating this as well. Uh, the, one of the most interesting examples that I've, I've seen is that there's some TAVR clinics that for all their pre-TAVR visits, they arrange for the patients to have all the imaging labs, um, clinical evaluations and decisions all done on the same day. So we can overcome uh, barriers for needing multiple uh, times for transportation. Okay, the, the last major area I'll talk about is the social and community context, which has several subdomains and uh, we'll go over them quickly. So first, telemedicine, and uh, this, this has been a great way to overcome some barriers for transportation, but what I'll remark here is that not all areas are well served by high-speed internet or wireless service, so um, it might not be a, uh, a cure for all individuals to be able to access care, uh, but, it, but it has been something that's grown majorly after the pandemic. Um, and this areas that might be particularly vulnerable to this are rural areas, and we know that rural areas um, have a higher incidence for ischemic heart disease and other negative health out health consequences. Um, so that can be an important barrier to make sure you're aware of for your patients. And then lastly on this slide, sex and gender. Uh, this, this can be considered a social determinant in the context that uh, cardiovascular disease remains a leading cause of death in some sp sex specific conditions, uh, particularly with pregnancy. Um, also, there remains an under recognition of uh, women specific risk factors. And then uh, there's a, the group of individuals that identify as LGBTQ plus um, are also an area uh, that's very understudied in the literature. The social and community context also extend into considering uh, social inclusion and social isolation was recently highlighted by the Surgeon General as a major risk factor that often goes unrecognized yet has a major impact on health outcomes. And is especially common among our elderly patients. In these graphs, the Surgeon General report shows that there's a growing problem um, in, this, in this area. Over the last 20 years, the problem um, has really drastically changed. And if you check out each of these graphs, although they're hard to read, um, they're a little fuzzy here in person, um, but there are now more hours of social isolation, less hours of family engagement, less companionship, less engagement with friends and now not household members. 
And I expect that because these data only went up to 2020, that this has only worsened since the pandemic. Fortunately, there are several tools and ways to assess for this. And this is one of the social determinants that we now assess across our Michigan medicine population. And uh, we can make recommendations for plugging these individuals into community centers like the Y, senior centers, and other similar locations. And if unaddressed, it can be a major risk factor. In that same Surgeon General report, they liken social isolation to the same risk as smoking 15 cigarettes per day, to put that into context. Next, uh, the last social determinant I'll talk about, which is uh, the one that I focus on the most, is food and nutrition insecurity. You can think about food insecurity as having limited or uncertain access to adequate foods, and nutrition insecurity as having um, limited availability mm -hmm access, affordability, or utilization of food that or beverages that promote well-being and prevent and treat disease. So food insecurity is access uh, to food in general, and nutrition security is access to healthy foods. And uh, there's been many screeners developed, uh, even as simple as two-question screeners that are standardized for all ages um, that are easy to ask in clinic and have also been integrated into our social determinant screener across our system. I'll take a little bit of a brief dive into this area as my area of focus. Um, and we'll talk about um, food security. In, in this recent uh, paper that uh, we had published, national trends suggest that among those with cardiovascular disease, those individuals face about double uh, the frequency of food insecurity as those without. Um, and we, sh we show this for not only coronary disease, but also stroke and heart failure. If you walk through each of these figures, so the first is coronary, second is stroke, and third is heart failure. Um, you can see that over time, both those with and without the condition, the numbers were increasing. And at uh, almost every time point, the, the, uh, the, those that have the condition in yellow compared to those in blue are about double the rate. And uh, even though it looks like the graphs are, graphs are separating over time, the, the numbers stay statistically similar, except for heart failure. This is a population where there's a, a burgeoning increase in uh, food insecurity among those individuals. What's more, this effect is also seen across racial and ethnic groups. And although the numbers jump around a bit because these are smaller subgroups and uh, particularly the uh, uh, subgroup of Asian individuals, uh, there's only a short time span, uh, but uh, statistically the odds ratio ended up being about the same for each of these groups where there's about double uh, the risk of food insecurity regardless of race or ethnicity. Although, like I said, the Asian subgroup had too uh, small of a sample to, to be able to measure that. These observations that food insecurity and uh, food quality can be potential drivers of health outcomes has led to a resurgence in uh, understanding and a thought that we can now start to consider food as medicine. In other words, um, thinking about using food as part of the medical care of patients. And there's a variety of ways that this is being studied and deployed. Um, in, in this pyramid that I show here um, with differences different areas between prevention and treatment starting at the top, we can, we can think about now starting to integrate these within clinical care. And there are several large trials going on of things like medically tailored meals or medically tailored groceries. And uh, if you all haven't seen the excellent work uh, done by Scott Hummel in this area and his work at the VA, um, he's doing some excellent work at um, using medically tailored meals to help treat heart failure patients. Going down the, the pyramid, though, there's other ways that this is thinking of being integrated and is rolling out, including produce prescription programs that allow for low or no cost uh, healthy foods for individuals. And there's also the large federal programs like WIC, SNAP, and school meals. And even broader, we think about uh, things at the population level. And these are the things that I'm going to talk about here in just, in just a, a brief while, um, thinking about um, things like changes in uh, trans fat policies. But first, let's, let's talk about what's already happening here at Michigan Medicine. And I spoke about this a little bit at a somewhat recent faculty meeting, but I thought it'd be helpful to go over again um, to refresh our memories. And over the last several years, a, a team at Michigan Medicine, not myself, has been working to roll out a set of universal social determinants of health screeners. And now, um, as, of, as of this year, all patients in both the inpatient and the outpatient areas receive a screen like this every 11 months. And the screen covers 12 areas, including behavioral areas like alcohol use, tobacco use, and physical activity, but also the built environment, uh, financial toxicity, community determinants like housing and utility problems, transportation needs, virtual care access, financial needs, social isolation, and food insecurity. So uh, and this infographic that I have here is actually a screenshot from Epic. Um, 
that, that we can uh, view for each of our patients. The, these screeners are um, mostly administered as part of the check-in process, so it happens without us even knowing it, and the patients are prompted to complete them um, within a week or so before each of their uh, visits, and uh, the, the time required is not, not too long. Within about 10 minutes, they can complete all, all of the uh, screening areas. And certainly, even though this doesn't cover all of the domains that I had presented, it gives us enough information to change how we think about our patient's care. So like I said, screening for uh, the university is now live across the institution and screening for subspecialties at Michigan went live in spring. And there's a dashboard that you can look at online so you can check out these. They're delayed by about a month or two. Um, but um, what I've shown here is numbers from all of the cardiology clinics for the last 12 months. And um, what we can see is that um, there are three, the, the top three uh, social determinants here, but they're quite common with virtual care being, uh, having limited virtual care options and almost one in five, um, followed by social isolation being quite common at 14% among our patients. And then uh, the third most common is food insecurity at about 6.4%. Um, interestingly, when you uh, look over to the primary care clinics um, compared to ours, the rates of, uh, of social determinants are two to three times higher among our population than among the um, internal medicine population. So um, we may be seeing more of these patients more than a lot of our colleagues. And if, if you think about it with these numbers, um, which, within a typical clinic day, the, there's a good chance we're, in, we're going to interact with at least one individual um, that has one of these uh, social determinant factors. Now, um, you might be wondering what happens if they screen positive? What's my responsibility? <laughs> what happens next? So if they screen positive in any of these areas, they're also asked if they want to have help um, to address each of these areas. And for things like uh, tobacco, alcohol, and physical activity, um, they'll leave that to us to address. Um, but if they answer yes to any of these other areas, it triggers a system action where there's a team of social workers, the guest assistance program, um, as well as uh, community um, health workers, a virtual care team, and a patient financial counselor that will get notified and reach out to the patient within five business days to figure out how they can help that patient. The, the only uh, exception to this rule is if they screen positive for intimate partner violence, they don't have to ask for help they will get help and somebody will reach out to them uh, whether they say yes or no to that question. So um, there's a lot done on the back end after this is, this is done. And if the patient is contacted, then they sh there should be a note in the system as well that says uh, what happened uh, with that contact so that we know that that can be followed up on. Now, um, like I said, the network of supports that we have takes the major uh, burden off the clinician. However, we can still have a role and uh, first, what we can do is looking at that dashboard, uh, we can review the screener and remember that they have to ask for help to get help. And we can mention it to the patient that we're aware of this. And in my experience, I found that patients that haven't asked for help before may be more likely to say that they are interested in help once it's brought up by their healthcare provider. And there is a, a referral for GAP social work as a combined referral that we can put into the system and somebody will reach out to that patient within five days. Also, we might notice that they haven't answered the questions and often that's because they might not have virtual access as they're approximately one in five and maybe higher than that because they're not answering that survey online. Um, there may be more people that, that are at risk. So we can still have a role in helping in this area. All right, so that's what we're already doing here at University of Michigan. However, CMS is also making some considerations that we should be aware of and uh, they're integrating it now into uh, their, their health equity frameworks among their top priority, top five priorities that they identified, the top they identified is expanding the collection reporting and analysis of standardized data. And they say that this should now include the social determinants of health. And these can be documented by ICD-Z codes, uh, which are available um, and ever expanding. Um, and it's, it's, we're continuously learning how they're gonna expand this further, but now um, there is a way that social determinants can be tied to reimbursement um, that'll present in just a moment. I didn't want to show uh, the long, the long and lengthening list of Z codes that are, are available here. Uh, this is the most recent update from CMS, and if you run your eyes over this uh, small font, you can see that there are many areas that they cover, like education, employment, the physical environment, housing, food insecurity, and other aspects of the social mm -hmm. environment. And like I said, this is now um, uh, worked towards being tied to payment. 
they recently proposed that these Z codes can now be uh, linked to modifiers. This G01361 that they have uh, can be can be added on with a RVU tag of 0.18. Um, and this is not for um, billing for when somebody has a social determinant of health, but when a provider spends the five to 15 minutes that's required to think through that and help to address it with the patient. And this is sort of wild to me, but um, the way that it's set up for billing on the patient end, they may end up with a higher copay because of it <laughs> of two to three extra dollars. So um, I don't know how that decision was made, but it seems a little bit short sighted. Uh, the only exception is that if it's done as part of an annual wellness visit, then there's no additional copay for that. So hopefully they uh, rethink that in the future. They also addressed other, or they also added other G codes, uh, the ones that I list in the in the second major bullet point here. Uh, the importance of these is that uh, previous to this, our support care members, the the multiple teams that I presented a few slides ago, uh, previously they they weren't able to bill for their time and they didn't really have strong supports in place. But now there are codes where these uh, care support team members and uh, community health workers can uh, bill for addressing social determinants of health. So I don't believe that that comes with an additional copay from what my understanding was. So, but it is, so this is a, helps a leg up for our support services. All right, so that was a whirlwind overview of social determinants of health. Um, I tried to go to cover a lot of ground there, um, but I wanna take a little bit of a change in focus. And as a, as a key part to addressing these social determinants of health, um, there needs to be work done outside the clinical setting, like I said, and the root causes need to be addressed. And clinicians, um, we have powerful tools and uh, powerful ability to impact policy. Um, so I'm going to take a little bit of a turn, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, health and nutrition policy through a few case examples. I'll first start by going through a paradigm um, that I use for thinking about translating research um, and patient narratives into policy with examples within the transfat area and the, with the transfat restrictions in New York a City and beyond, as well as thinking about grocery delivery for SNAP participants. And here's where I really hope to, uh, maybe motivation not the right word, but encourage you to uh, think about how you can apply this to your research and your clinical work. First, I'll start with Frieden's health impact pyramid. Uh, this, I think, best contextualizes the potential health impact of different efforts based on their population impact. At the top of the pyramid are individual counseling and education sessions or clinical interventions. Basically, these are the things that happen when our white coats are on. So we're working with people on the individual level. At the bottom of the pyramid are the, usually the things that are impacted by policy. Um, uh, within the work that we do, we can think about that. This as changing default options, um, changing guidelines for how we approach care, um, or changing things like state and federal policies. And uh, in, in this overall context, I like to think that I operate both at the top of the pyramid when I'm one-on-one -on -one with a patient in clinic, but then I'm also making a broader impact uh, through uh, nutrition and health policy changes um, when I'm, I'm working at the, bo the bottom of the pyramid in my academic work. Uh, but they're very connected, though. The things that happen in clinic motivate those decisions and that uh, what I should study and then vice versa, those things that I learn then impact the care that I provide for my patients. This, con this concept's also captured within this figure specifically within food policy, and it shows different levels of impact from policy down to the individual level. When we think about dietary habit, they're largely determined by personal preference, um, things like also like age, gender, education, uh, income, our health status, and our individual uh, skill sets in the kitchen. However, there are many other factors higher than the individual level, including the social, cultural, and community environment, but also food systems, government decisions, and global food markets. And um, what we should know is that a shift in any of these higher order factors can initiate a cascade effect. Uh, we all learned this during the pandemic um, going grocery shopping and seeing what we could or could not get on our tables um, so that it's much easier to contextualize post-pandemic. Um, what we can think, as an example, we can think about is if there's a change in food or agricultural policy, this might impact food production or distribution, and that can result in shifts in food availability or even cost. And then that for, that for because people are especially price sensitive uh, to different foods, this can impact purchases. Um, my point here is that uh, changes on the policy level can drastically impact individual choice and preference, and then uh, therefore heart, cardiovascular outcomes. Within this work, I this is the paradigm uh, that I, I choose to work in. Um, 
which is a home cooked uh, recipe for understanding when a policy impact can be made. And I call it safe. So this stands for S support. Um, when you think about something that you want to impact, it needs to have either broad or guideline based support, uh, broad public support or guideline based support. Um, something has to be actionable. That means there has to be some sort of mechanism for a policy decision or a policy change. It has to be also financially feasible. And then uh, lastly, it has to have uh, evidence to support the change. So we're gonna go through two examples within this paradigm. First, we'll talk about the case of trans fat where we explore the evidence for a nutrition policy change that happened in New York state. So in New York, starting in about 2007, they began to restrict the use of trans fats in restaurant foods. So, um, and then that expanded to other counties. So we, we thought we would study this. And what we did is um, we wanted to compare those areas that had the bans in place compared to the areas without it. So what we did is identify a control group that was matched based on their level of urbanicity using a statewide database of hospitalization called SPARC. We then uh, showed that before these policies went into place that there, even though there were different, different levels of uh, cardiovascular disease in different areas, their trends were similar. Mm -hmm. So then we applied what's called a difference in difference um, uh, uh, method uh, to these data and we compare to these two groups. So uh, to go over those two groups again, you see these counties in red at the lower right-hand corner. Uh, these are the most urban areas and we compared them to the dark blue areas, which are other highly urban areas. And then the pink were compared to the uh, lighter blue areas. So here's what we found. Our primary outcome was the composite of uh, hospitalization for MI and stroke combined, but we also look at these outcomes individual, ind individually. And among all counties that had restrictions uh, on trans fats in restaurants, by three years after this, there was an additional 6.2% decline in uh, cardiovascular events compared to those matched counties without restrictions. And this was similar in both men and women. Uh, we also wanted to make sure we weren't just capturing some sort of New York City specific effect. So we uh, did some sensitivity analysis where we only looked at the most urban areas. And then we also ex excluded New York City from the analysis and our findings were the same. We also looked individually at myocardial infarction and stroke and for MI, the findings were similar. There was a significant 7.8% additional decline in MI by three years after the ban. And then um, this was similar for both men and women. But then when we looked at stroke, there seemed to be probably only an effect in women, which ended up fitting with the uh, prior data to suggest that trans fat may have a higher effect on uh, stroke in women compared to men. So, Within the context of my par prior paradigm, these evidence supported the proposed ban in trans fat. To review the full paradigm, there was strong support from guidelines and the government to limit trans fat. There were actionable pieces of legislation, um, including that the FDA had the authority to make it so that the main source of trans fats in the food supply, partially hydrogenated oils, could be no longer um, allowed as a safe food additive. Um, it also was financially feasible because other similar oils are available for food companies to change over to without changing uh, what a food tastes like or uh, looks like. So um, Oreos, for example, wouldn't change. <laughs> They'd still be the same old Oreos. Um, also, um, there's strong evidence, um, including uh, from this, this study, another uh, group uh, showed lower mortality in the areas where trans fats uh, were restricted. I and mean, then there's also basic science uh, and, and uh, observational data to suggest that there's major shifts in risk factors from higher or lower intake of trans fats. So the F FDA did end up making it so partially hydrogenated oils were no longer recognized as safe food additives. And this took several years to implement. There were several delays, but this is now fully in effect. There are a few ingredients that slip through the loopholes, but by and large, over 95% of any trans fats are no longer in our food supply. Um, I used to point a finger at Skippy peanut butter because they were using one of these loophole oils, but they also <laughs> um, changed their, uh, their recipe. So I can't point at uh, Skippy peanut butter anymore. Um, but uh, uh, this now um, is now fully in place. And within this, uh, the context of what I was talking about before, I think this policy shift is important from a health equity lens because individuals that are eating more trans fats are eating uh, at more fast food restaurants where meals could have four to 10 grams of trans fat per serving, and even one to two grams is associated with an increased risk for events. So uh, this is hopefully uh, influencing um, individuals of lower socioeconomic status more strongly. And 
Uh, there's a consortium globally that's now trying to ban trans fat across the world. And um, over two thirds of the population now has uh, no longer exposure to uh, partially hydrogenated oils. All right, so uh, for the second case that I wanna present is the case of grocery delivery. Uh, maybe everyone in this room has used grocery delivery at some point because of the pandemic. And on this map, I show that uh, there were eight states that were um, slated to be part of a pilot to allow SNAP participants, which SNAP is formerly called the Food Stamp Program. And they were gonna use their benefits to purchase food online and test out what happened in these eight states. So we wanted to know um, within these eight states where this pilot was starting, how many individuals that were the most vulnerable, so those that are living in food deserts or areas that have um, poor access to grocery stores, um, how many of them were already within grocery delivery areas um, even before this pilot was rolling out? So um, what, what, I, what we did, and um, I spent a painstaking amount of time uh, using grocery store websites to find out which zip codes and census tracts <laughs> uh, grocery stores delivered to. And we found that uh, almost 90% of, of uh, food desert census tracts were already within grocery delivery areas. And this was before the pandemic um, even started. So, so this could be a major impact for individuals um, that uh, uh, face lack of access to grocery stores for problems such as lack of transportation. And just within these eight states, um, thinking about individuals that live with, in food deserts, the potential impact of this is enormous. So um, for, for those eight states, that means that um, over 450,000 families or 900,000 individuals, 400,000 of which are children, 120,000 elderly people that are just the SNAP participants could then potentially, uh, if they expanded the pilot to everyone to allow for grocery delivery for their SNAP benefit, um, could then get uh, increased access to this. And these are the people that are the most at risk for transportation barriers. If we we're thinking, if we're thinking about expanding this to the whole country, then uh, the numbers are, are even larger than this. Our study was published in uh, JAMA Network Open right at the end of 2019. And this ended up being fortunate timing for this work to make a policy impact. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through those steps about, um, about uh, what happened next. And, and this is how I think about following up from um, and, and how this integrates back into the safe paradigm. So as we all know, COVID took off just a few months later in March of 2020. And uh, as this was happening, um, I, I did two things. That was also a great month because that was right after I did my interview here, like <laughs> the week before the pandemic started. It was like, a, it was like, it was a four years ago, basically to the day today that I was here. So first what I did is um, use, having these data published, I wrote an op-ed and this was submitted uh, to the Hill Online, which is a common uh, source of news for members of Congress to receive their news. And simultaneously what I did is then I then reached out to my a uh, local Congress member who at the time was uh, Rosa DeLauro talking about my research and the potential impact on this policy. So she was open to this and thought it was a very interesting idea. So she worked on a letter and a uh, letter was eventually signed by 58 members of Congress. And this was sent to the Secretary of Agriculture. You can see here at the bottom, I'm citing that, that paper. And I was honestly surprised at how quickly this happened. Um, gave me a lot of confidence in our <laughs> representatives for sure. And then within about a month, um, the USDA decided to opt uh, opted in to expand the pilot then nationally for any states that wanted to participate. And there was a huge interest. Um, you can see here that already by May 20th, when they initially um, announced the program, there were several states, including Michigan, that jumped uh, right on the bandwagon and right on board. When we review the, uh, the policy, um, it's kind of wild that this whole process unfolded in just it unfolded in just a few months. My article was published in December of 2019, and then by May, the policy uh, change, it took place. And I show here each of the steps along the individual parts of this paradigm and how each of these steps aligned with that different part of the, the safe paradigm. And um, given that grocery shopping, um, when they when they used uh, individual cell phone data to track locations of where they traveled and where they may have picked up COVID, and uh, one of the major areas that people tended to pick up COVID uh, during the pandemic was at grocery stores. Um, I like to think that some of the most vulnerable individuals, which who may have, may have been the most hesitant to uh, go grocery shopping, um, may have benefited from this type of policy change. And 
as a follow-up for any time a policy is changed, the ultimate question is eventually, um, once this works its way through, what's, what's the eventual impact and what can we measure? So after writing the letter, like I said, there was a rapid expansion and within a few months, um, 48 states, which included the District of Columbia had signed on and it took a few years for the last uh, three states to um, jump into the pool, but now all uh, 51 states, which includes uh, DC are now part of this pilot, which uh, the next farm bill is currently be being debated and it'll probably uh, transition into a permanent program. In a subsequent study, I also worked with a team of students at Stanford to measure um, the use of SNAP when California expanded to being one of these pilot states. And we can see here that there was a rapid expansion in its use um, over time. You can see on the x-axis as time and y is um, uh, uh, thousands of dollars that were spent in SNAP online. And overall, this uh, first California during this time period only accounted for about 3% of overall SNAP funds. Uh, but we don't know eventually where this went to. We can see that the red areas, which are rural counties, there was a tapering off of use. Uh, but in the uh, urban and suburban areas, the curves were going up. The USDA subsequently also did a study on this, and they saw that similar to us um, approaching 3% um, during that first year was how much of the SNAP dollars were eventually being um, spent on SNAP online. Uh, but there aren't any data after this. But even though a small portion, certainly many millions of dollars being spent um, in this way. All right, so that, that's all, the, that's the information I wanted to share with you, but I also want to state that as okay. I move forward with my uh, K23 award, I'm gonna to continue to stick in this space. And I hope to give another talk in a few years talking about these projects, uh, but really I'm delving and staying into the SNAP space and I'm trying to understand how um, participating in SNAP really makes a impact on cardiovascular outcomes and mortality trying to figure out how people navigate the complexities of um, their medical and nutrition needs when they're participating in SNAP, and then using large databases of claims database to under understand how people are actually navigating our healthcare system. All right, before I open it up for questions, um, I'd like to thank, uh, first off, my family, which I have a picture here, uh, but um, also my mentorship team, uh, Ramaji, whose mentorship has been uh, incredible, and then the rest of my mentorship team that's listed here. Um, the ACC Disparities of Care Workgroup, who co-authored that Social Determinants of Health paper alongside uh, many members. And then lastly, the Social Determinants of Health team, who gets all the credit for rolling this out um, across our health system, um, who I've listed here and uh, who we hope to work with to uh, Try to teach other health systems how to do the same as we've done. All right, that's it. Thank you. Eric, uh, that was a great, great uh, talk. Um, I'm going to start with one question. Um, it seems you know you you make a great point that social determinants of health are very important to the patient's outcomes. We as clinicians sometimes I feel we get to the patient a little bit too late. Yeah. Um, and by the time they get to us, maybe, you know, some interventions could have done earlier on. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about what maybe efforts can be done earlier on in the, before the patient become a patient in a way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so, well, one of the things is helping people to become patients earlier in that process. So, um, thinking about back to the health policy change with the Affordable Care Act, there was you know, major strides to try to expand healthcare access to some of the most vulnerable individuals, particularly how states have expanded, well, most states have now expanded uh, Medicare and Medicaid. So thinking about policies like that. Um, and then you know, within how large health systems are built nowadays, um, there are large amount of funds that are set aside for community building and community networking. So you could choose any of these social determinants of health and there's ways within local communities that we can build towards addressing them. So um, if there's particular social determinants in health in a community, it gives the flexibility for those funds to be used by major health systems in those ways to maintain our nonprofit status. So, <laughs> good question. Dr. Pinsky. Wow, we are so lucky um, to have you here. I mean, just absolutely. I have two questions, they're, they're not related. Could you use large databases to see whether when your grocery online program went into effect, you actually reduced the incidence of COVID among those who shopped online? Could you overlap databases and figure that out? 
Yeah, so that's a great question. And as part of my K award, we're trying to uh, link data like that together. Um, so, so large grocery systems like Spartan Nash in Michigan, um, uh, we, we have access to their data now, but then um, in other um, grocery systems like, um, like Giant Foods out east, other researchers are working to try to take those uh, grocery data, which then have member cards attached to them, because that's how they have their SNAP IDs. And then that SNAP ID can then be linked to a common state identifier that links them to health outcomes. So as part of my K-23 award, one of the things that we proposed was not specifically for grocery delivery, but looking at trying to understand how people's behaviors shift around the time of major cardiac events by looking at their carts and what changes before and after they're in the hospital for those events. So it is possible. It, it's a uh, hard to get access to both and then get the <laughs> approvals to, to to identify those patients and link them together, but um, we're working on that. That's great. A second question. Um, you know, I'm so pleased with the current Ypsilanti um, health location. There's a smallish food pantry, and I understand there's going to be a bigger one at the new um, Ypsilanti location. What do food pantries do to all of this? Do they make a dent in the health of our populations? They do. So um, thinking about specifically within the SNAP population, uh, it, essentially the SNAP benefit is used like a, a monetary commodity. So like any other monetary commodity, food runs out. And we know by looking at patterns across uh, um, cycle months of SNAP that by the end of the month, people run out of money and they they need other sources of food. So they, places like food pantries, um, either at churches or community centers are major areas of access to support. And food pantries have started to move into a more modern era where we're not just taking anything that's donated, but trying to work with food systems to make food pantry foods healthier so that um, individuals in that context aren't relying on um, highly processed shelf-stable foods, but also um, foods that improve nutrition security as well. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? All right, we don't have any questions from the virtual audience. So thank you, Eric, so much. We look forward to, to seeing you again. Yeah, thank you.